Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here with you again today as you celebrate, and I can't believe this, the silver anniversary of the National Community Reinvestment uh, Coalition. Uh, but when I look at uh, John Taylor and I see his mane of silver hair, I know it has been 25 years. Um, last year at this conference, I spoke about the importance of protecting seniors from financial exploitation. And that's a concern that you've taken up through your National Neighbors Silver Campaign. For our part, we at the OCC are helping to identify ways that the banking industry can address the, the unique financial needs of older adults. And I'm very pleased with the progress that we've made together in this area. And of course, we are very pleased to be working with an organization that's been so dedicated to ensuring access to banking services, expanding mortgage opportunities, and promoting small business development and economic progress in communities across the country. While the NCRC and its partners can take enormous pride in all that's been accomplished over the past 25 years, the financial landscape is changing rapidly. These changes present both challenges and opportunities for the banking industry. The good news, however, is that new financial technology can be adapted to promote access to the types of financial opportunities that the NCRC has advocated for the past quarter century. Technological advances are shaping financial products and how they're delivered. There are, gro there are growing numbers of tech-savvy consumers who prefer to conduct financial transactions via computers and smartphones and to do so at any hour of the day or night. These customers are comfortable accessing cash from ATMs, making deposits via remote capture, using online services to apply for a loan, or resolving problems by chatting via text with a customer service representative. They use smartphone apps to make payments to friends or to apply for small loans. The shift in how consumers access financial services obviously poses a challenge to banks, which are competing in this arena against nimble and sophisticated financial techn technology companies, fintechs for short. Many fintechs do business exclusively via the internet using online and mobile applications. They're very new. So many of them have designed and built their systems to match their particular business model. By contrast, banks may have legacy technology systems that are outdated and could be expensive to modify or replace. Many banks also have extensive branch networks and they bear the significant cost of retaining this physical infrastructure. However, it would be wrong to assume that fintechs will replace banks and the products and services that they offer through established branch networks. I believe the national banks and federal savings associations supervised by the OCC are as nimble and innovative as the new financial technology startups. The fact is that innovation has been a hallmark of the US banking system since it was created in 1863 at the behest of President Lincoln. Historically, as banks' customers' expectations and needs have changed, national banks and federal thrifts have adapted and evolved. And the same is true today. Banks are engaged in research to help them adapt to rapid technolo technological change. Some banks are building innovation solutions in-house. Other banks are purchasing so-called white label solutions to enhance their existing technology platforms. And some are pursuing strategic partnerships with fintechs in order to bring new solutions on board more quickly. Through innovation, banks can and will be able to reach more customers, lower the cost of financial products and services, expand product offerings to better serve customers, and to make their branch networks more efficient. 
The OCC is committed to supporting responsible bank innovation. Last August, I announced an initiative to develop a comprehensive framework to improve the OCC's ability to identify and understand new and emerging trends and innovations in the financial services industry, as well as the evolving needs of consumers of financial services. This framework will outline our views on responsible innovation and enable us at the OCC to more effectively evaluate innovative products, services, or processes that require regulatory approval and to identify potential risks associated with adoption. Right now, we're putting the finishing touches on a white paper describing our perspective on innovation in banking. We plan to publish it very soon, and we will be inviting comment from banks, their customers, and everyone else with an interest in innovation. One area of particular interest to me and to the OCC involves the way innovative products or services would be considered under the Community Reinvestment Act. The CRA directs the federal financial institution regulators to assess banks' records of helping to meet the credit needs of the communities in which they are chartered. We also consider qualitative aspects, such as how a bank's use of innovative or flexible practices addresses the credit needs of low and moderate income individuals or areas. Another significant aspect of CRA involves the question of where bank services are provided. Historically, convenient access to branches within a community has been an important factor. Although the large bank CRA service test places primary emphasis on branches, alternative services systems for delivering retail banking systems are also considered. The OCC looks at the availability and effectiveness of a bank's systems for delivering retail banking services to low and moderate income areas and individuals. FinTech-related product enhancements and innovative lending programs or account services that banks offer are evaluated in line with these basic CRA principles. The banking agencies are currently working to finalize updates to a document known as the Interagency Questions and Answers Regarding Community Reinvestment. Those uh, Q&As will give additional guidance on how alternate, alternative delivery systems are to be considered by re the regulators. I hope that it will be helpful. However, I want to underscore my belief that technology may not be a substitute for a physical presence in low and moderate income communities. <laughs> the presence of a branch is not just an essential vehicle for providing financial services, it is a stabilizing force that helps determine whether communities thrive or just barely survive. That is why a bank's record of opening and closing branches in low and moderate income communities is considered under the CRA. The local bank is not only a source of credit, it is essential to the small businesses that are so important to a community's economic vitality. Many small businesses rely on convenient branch access for daily cash needs and for making deposits, particularly if they are depositing cash, as well as face-to-face -face management and expertise to meet their ongoing credit needs. For many customers, branches also remain the preferred place to do business. Senior citizens may feel more comfortable or secure about transacting their banking business in a branch setting and depend on having a face-to-face -face relationship with branch staff. Other customers rely on in-person meetings with bank personnel to answer their financial questions or to assist with more complicated transactions, such as a consumer or business loan, a mortgage application, or investments. 
And without a local bank, disadvantaged residents may be forced to choose between traveling great distances for basic financial services or dealing with payday lenders and check cashers or other uh, non-bank uh, entities. Let me add that brick and mortar branches play an important part of every bank's business strategy. They help banks build a brand in the community and branch location is high on the list of decision points for potential customers. And while some banks will open accounts online or through a call center, the vast majority of new accounts are opened in a branch. Indeed, with rising fraud and security concerns, many banks lean strongly towards branch-based account opening. However, maintaining and preserving an efficient and cost-effective branch network can be challenging. As consumers, particularly those in more affluent neighborhoods, neighborhoods, increasingly meet their basic needs for financial services through alternative delivery systems, such as ATMs, online or mobile platforms, and call centers, branch traffic has declined. Many banks are managing the expense of keeping branches by cutting back square footage, revising staffing roles, or introducing sophisticated technology solutions. Smaller size branches, multi-function ATMs, self-service kiosks, or mini branches located in commercial space such as a mall or a grocery store can offer branch services most, more cost effectively. Mobile branches can serve multiple communities. A pop-up bank can open for a short time to sign up new accounts. A few banks are redesigning branches as Wi-Fi cafes to draw in new customers. Some banks are also revising or updating their in-branch services while finding alternative ways to meet customer needs. Cross-training staff as universal salespeople who can explain multiple products and enhance branch uh, efficiency is an important change, as well as new technologies which are automating operations. One system helps tell tellers handle customer transactions by dispensing cash and automatically reflecting the transaction in the bank's daily balance account. Online concierge systems that book appointments may help branch staff manage their time efficient, efficiently and give customers added convenience. To both improve branch efficiency and serve customers better, video conferencing stations in a branch lobby can connect customers to call center personnel who speak their language or to more highly qualified personnel who can provide advice on complex transactions or small business development matters. As you can see, Innovation can help banks thrive by increasing bank uh, efficiency and improving financial products and their delivery. But it is important to stop and ask a few questions. Are today's innovative financial products and servicing, services enhancing the customer's experience and helping people manage their finances better? Can these innovations be used to move unbanked and underbanked co uh, consumers into the financial mainstream? Can we ensure that innovative products and technology solutions meet the needs of low and moderate income customers in a fair and cost-effective manner? These questions deserve serious consideration. The benefits of innovation will be undermined if fintech developments and product innovation involve excessive cost or disadvantaged unbanked or underbanked consumers? These are questions that banks, regulators, policymakers, and practitioners like you need to consider now. Certainly, many fintech solutions provide consumer benefit particularly to low and moderate income individuals. For example, 
Real-time account access is important to lower-income consumers who are managing their money to the penny and cannot afford to in inadvertently overdraw an account. There are even some innovative fintech services that can be used to help consumers with financial management by smoothing out their income flows and anticipating recurring expenses to avoid a mismatch. And there are great opportunities. Among lower income households earning less than $25,000 annually, nearly three quarters have mobile phones and slightly over half are using smartphones. Increasing numbers of unbanked consumers have smartphones and 90% of underbanked consumers have mobile phones, 73% of which are smartphones. Despite these high rates of internet access, differences remain. Demographic factors such as income, education, and age affect internet usage rates, and consumers in rural areas show lower rates of adoption. Additionally, lack of broadband, broadband access or the cost of data usage or network coverage for rural consumers and the cost of even basic cell phone service for low-income consumers may be factors that limit online or mobile banking usage. Banks are also embracing new types of transaction accounts and broadening access to their loan products. Lower cost prepaid cards or checklist bank accounts accessed through a debit card may be suitable entry products for unbanked or underbanked consumers and potentially can pave the way to a longer term, broader account relationship. Automated underwriting systems that incorporate alternative credit history information such as rent and utility payments may expand creditworthy borrowers' access to mortgage or consumer loan programs. In addition, banks have long supported financial education efforts. Today, some branches are setting aside excess space for use by nonprofit counseling programs. Many banks also offer their customers online financial counseling, budgeting, and money management tools. As more people use mobile wallets, consumers may be able to leverage information about transactions and spending to manage their finances in real time. All of these financial services developments give us a lot to consider, and our upcoming white paper should provide a good start. I believe that by taking full advantage of innovation to better meet customer needs and to expand access to the banking system and by responsibly managing the associated risks, banks and thrifts of all sizes will continue to be essential providers of financial products and services to consumers, businesses, and their communities. I want to thank all of you and your organizations for your ongoing commitment to promoting economic opportunity. Your work and continued engagement are a critical underpinning of the national effort to improve access to financial services. Thank you for giving me this time, and I look forward to your questions. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Comptroller. Do, do you actually say Mr. Comptroller? Is uh, that the, uh... Usually people just say Tom or hey you. Oh, okay. <laughs> it seems you're in such a lofty position, I feel like I have to have some title in there someplace. Um, okay, Tom. Um, so uh, obviously we're pleased to hear the, your remarks, and I was particularly pleased to hear your remarks about the necessity of uh, bank branches. But also in, in Los Angeles recently, you spoke a lot about the conditional approval process so that you are ensuring that as, as banking institutions acquire or expand, mm -hmm. uh, that they're putting a forward commitment, that, they're, that, that there's an approval, but it's, it's conditioned upon a plan or a CRA plan or mm -hmm. something specific going forward. And how, how is the OCC looking at enforcing that uh, once there is a conditional approval? 
Okay. Uh, thank you, John. Um, uh, you know, in recent uh, transactions, we have imposed as a condition of the approval uh, of the merger or acquisition uh, the requirement of a, a, a compliance CRA compliance plan. That's significant that it's in the order. Uh, that makes it uh, enforceable uh, from a supervisory standpoint. Uh, you know, we certainly expect uh, 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 institutions to uh, willingly and completely comply with that commitment. But in the event that they don't, uh, that is grounds for uh, further supervisory action. So this is a, uh, a unique uh, uh, tool in our uh, toolbox that we can use where there are uh, questions about the underlying record of the institutions involved uh, or whether there's questions about whether the statutory test for uh, convenience and needs has been met. Uh, we think that uh, uh, this isn't something that's uh, uh, going to be used in every transaction, but certainly where there are uh, documented grounds for it, we will use it and we will uh, review it uh, through the supervisory process. And, and how, how do you arrive at that conditional approval in terms of its connection to public benefit and how is it kind of, well, this is, is there a role for us to play in that uh, process? Absolutely. I, th I think we've uh, uh, relied uh, heavily on uh, both the underlying CRA record and public evaluations, but uh, it's a critical role uh, that uh, 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 groups like uh, the members of NCRC that are in the field and are familiar with the bank's uh, activities and record to be part of that process. Okay. By the way, I, I named a bunch of people from the OCC, and I, I realize there's a couple of people I sh should have also recognized, Bob Gossin, um, who's the Deputy Comptroller for uh, Public Affairs. And then, yeah, Bob. <laughs> and then, the fabulous, the wonderful, uh, <laughs> Drew Moss, uh, who is the program manager for Community Relations and Minority Affairs. <clears throat> the reason he's fabulous and wonderful is because he worked for us for many years. Oh. And, uh, well, for the record, I can vouch for Andrew being wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Tom, so has the OCC considered uh, working with other bank regulators involved in mergers and the merger and acquisition process to create more of a standard procedure for evaluating the public benefit of proposed mergers. It, it seems that th th there seems to be different approaches and different definitions of what they mean by public benefit and, 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 and responses to proposed mergers and so on. It seems to be different from regulatory agency to, to the regular, not well, totally, but no, I mean, some I, differences. Yeah, at the end of the day, we're applying the same statutory factors uh, pretty much. I mean, there may be different statutes, but they're the same factors. Uh, the only suggestion I'd make is really to look at uh, uh, the approval letters uh, that we've issued uh, that contain uh, CRA plans, because I think you'll see both the factual basis and the analysis that supports uh, that remedy. So is this something that comes up in FFIEC uh, conversations? There's a lot of work in coordination uh, uh, with the FFIEC agencies and certainly in development of uh, CRA uh, Q&As, uh, examination uh, procedures. Uh, you know, there's really a need to have uniform approaches. But I think what your question gets to is more how we apply uh, the yeah. statutory requirements to a particular transaction. You mentioned Q&A, so I'm going to mm -hmm. uh, use that as a segue mm -hmm. to this next question. So uh, obviously the statute hasn't been, mm -hmm. CRA statute mm -hmm. has not been touched in many years, but the way that the prudential regulators are able to modify this, or redefine or expand mm -hmm. the statute or, or make changes to the statute, they're really not changes to the statute, but it's through the regulatory process and particularly through your Q&A guidance mm -hmm. to financial institutions. <clears throat> years ago, it seems like 10 years ago, uh, they put out a request for comments on the next proposed Q&A, and we talked about assessment areas and things that could, mm -hmm. could occur it within that process. And we've been waiting patiently, and I, I have to say, um, Eric Belsky from the Federal Reserve was here yesterday, and we asked him the question of when are these Q&As finally going to come out, and he said the same word that Barry, Barry said to me uh, as we sat there together, soon. <laughs> so, and I think I heard that two years ago from different, so I'm wondering how soon, soon is uh, with these Q&As. Well, uh, 
you, you were, in your introduction, which I thought was great, you talked about my dear friend. Uh, soon is the equivalent <laughs> among regulators. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, okay, so no, no further uh, insight on that. Uh, no, one additional point, I mean, I think this goes back to, uh, you know, I was pleased that you announced uh, Gravetta's elevation to be a senior deputy comptroller, yeah. which is really <laughs> significant. She's my top tier, part of my top tier management team. Uh, when we went down the path of uh, using the Q&A process to you know, fill in the gaps, uh, largely for what I was talking about today, how technology and uh, the sophistication of both community development organizations and the banking system to try to fill in the gaps as much as we could, uh, I told her that I wanted rolling CRA Q&A. And by rolling, I meant on an ongoing, efficient, basis. So that's going to be one of Gravetta's charges. All right. So we can blame you going forward. <laughs> <laughs> now I have yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I'll uh, ask you another question here. Um, as loans and deposits are delivered electronically, mm -hmm. without a relationship to geography, how will you adjust CRA regulations to account for the current fact that assessment areas remain tied to deposit-taking branches. Yeah, I think that's one of the, uh, the that's one of the policy issues that I think we're all going to have to confront, uh, you know, sooner or later. Yes. Uh, the, you know, we're talking about a law which uh, was adopted in 1977, which seems like yesterday for me, uh, but uh, a lot's changed. I've talked today about uh, fintech. Uh, you know, there is uh, the prospect that, uh, you know, you're going to have electronic, widespread electronic delivery systems that are not going to bear a relationship back uh, to a geographical location. So, you know, policymakers, and I include uh, NCRC, uh, the regulators and members of Congress, really are going to have to at some point address that issue of whether or not to uh, broaden the geographic uh, basis of the CRA. The assessment area. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so this is obviously something we've been mm -hmm. talking about for a long time, about possibly there being some guidance within the Q&A. Yeah, on there, there will be. A, but if the you could speak picture. close to this microphone and tell me, do you, do you, <laughs> do you, think, uh, <laughs> do you think that, uh, well, you're not going to tell me what's in the Q&A. We're going to have to wait with yeah. the rest of the universe. Apply the pressure to Gravetta. Okay. <laughs> Gravetta. <laughs> this is why you make the big bucks. <laughs> Alrighty, so, um, so how does the OCC monitor the progress of financial institutions meeting the terms of their conditional mm -hmm. approvals? Um, how this manifests itself for us, for example, is years ago, uh, mm -hmm. one institution, and I don't think they have any, any applications before you, so I can actually mention them, Capital One, made this grandiose announcement about we're going to do a $180 billion commitment, and, and it, it wasn't done in concert with mm -hmm. groups or specific to what was needed in different areas, and it wasn't vetted and negotiated with just this announcement, and we're going to, and then seemingly looking at what's being done, we're just not seeing, seeing the impact of that announcement. It looks like just business as usual. And so, you know, how do, how do we um, ensure going forward that as, as, uh, as institutions, Make, make these commitments and conditional approvals? How, how is it that, how is it enforced? How is it, uh, how are they held accountable to whatever sure. those yeah. uh, promises are within those appro conditional yeah, I, approvals? I, again, yeah, I'm not it's, gonna, a, it's similar to the first question. Sure, but yeah, again, I'm, yeah, I'm not gonna comment about any particular institution that we supervise, okay. but I do think there's a real distinction between a, a voluntary commitment that an institution makes versus what we're talking about, something very specific here, a uh, fact-based uh, applying the CRA law in the context of a, a merger and acquisition. This is, uh, uh, this is a basic of, uh, I'll give you an example, when we charter a bank uh, or issue, we issue conditions in that order, if you violate any one of those conditions, that is a per se basis for a, uh, a, an enforcement action. So we're talking about you know, uh, a very uh, significant uh, legal requirement that has uh, teeth to it. Yeah. So one thing we've been picking up lately uh, from a few banks is 
there seems to be, they say this, I don't know how true it is, mm -hmm. that we don't, we don't longer aspire to get an outstanding. It's not that important, not important any longer. We just, the satisfactory is fine, so 98% mm -hmm. of the, well, 98% of the banks get either a satisfactory or an outstanding. So, you know, what's, what's the point? And then you can get an outstanding CRA and be downgraded for a fair lending reason. So increasingly banks are saying, you know, do we really want to respire to an outstanding? And some are saying no. And I'm um, curious as to your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I would hope that uh, all the institutions that we supervise recognize that their, uh, their basis for being chartered was to serve the credit needs of their entire community. So I would, I would hope that that really is not the policy of any institution. Uh, banks are chartered for a purpose, uh, and uh, you know, I would expect, just as we strive to be the best we can, I would uh, expect, and I, I think that's largely the view of most of the institutions we supervise, that they want to both be profitable and to uh, meet uh, the needs of their customers. You know, I, I think one thing that would be helpful here if you really if the Q&A isn't really yet done, um, is the idea of having a high satisfactory and a low satisfactory, um, and, and that wouldn't probably take place in the Q&A, but at least then, you know, banks might be measured as, look, you're, you're, you've passed, but mm -hmm. you've barely passed, you know, instead of this, this sort of one-size-fits-all rating of satisfactory, mm -hmm. and I, I'm wondering whether that might, that might help uh, generate more interest in, in banks. Mm -hmm striving to do a better job. Yeah, th that could be, I mean, you know, I think- Just a been, thought. No, it's been, you know, considered and uh, uh, bandied about in the past. Uh, I, again, I'm under the oath uh, of secrecy here, so I oh. can't tell you what the Ooh. is up to. Oh, I'm gonna yeah. read into that yeah, right yeah. there. Yeah. At your uh, own peril. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, so w one thing that, it, that it has occurred is the, um, as branches close, uh, there was a Berkeley study cited mm -hmm. by uh, which Fed, um, Dory, which which Fed cited the uh, Berkeley study? Was it the Bar New York Fed uh, cited a Berkeley study about when branches close? There's a real drop off in small business lending, mm -hmm. and it and it occurs even if another branch opens. It occurs for a, a period of ten years. So, and of course, this is one mm -hmm. of the most challenging, most desperately needed kind of loans that are, that are mm -hmm. in in traditionally underserved neighborhoods. Uh, what, what is it that, um, how do we sort of address this drop off in, in, mm -hmm. in business lending as branches close and what is the OCC's thinking around encouraging more small business lending in the, in the uh, uh, aftermath of a branch closing? Um, you know, again, I think we have an obligation to measure uh, you know, the, the level of all types of lending that a bank does, particularly in low to moderate income communities. Uh, in my remarks, I, I think we're alluding to the same uh, issue that you are, is that a branch in a low to moderate income community has a much or an oversized impact than a uh, branch in another community. And I think that's something that at a minimum we need to take into account when we're assessing the uh, re bank's record of opening and closing branches. And that's something that uh, you know, I want to emphasize to uh, our people in the OCC that that's, while there are economic factors that are going to drive those decisions, uh, there, th that is something that needs to be assessed in the CRA context. So, uh, <clears throat> last point is a comment, and I meant to make this earlier. Uh, I, I'm personally very impressed, and, and I think a lot of folks mm -hmm. here are as well, you're really, from a regulatory perspective, setting the standard for making sure that women and minorities have good jobs, have leadership positions in regulatory agencies. And I want to really thank you for that because those perspectives of bringing in diverse people mm -hmm. uh, are just going to, I think, enhance the ability of the OCC to be very effective in this space. And, and kudos to you for leading the push to diversify the OCC. Yeah, thank you, John. So, and thank you. Yes. Uh, I have one thing I want to do before I leave. I want to present to John a copy of a page in the uh, uh, 2015 annual report of the uh, Co Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. And John, I don't think uh, you've ever would ever see a picture of John Taylor inside our annual report. <laughs> <laughs> uh.